Welcome to Econ Talk, part of the Library of Economics and Liberty. I'm your host, Russ Roberts of Stanford University's Hoover Institution. Our website is econtalk.org, where you can subscribe, comment on this podcast, and find links and other information related to today's conversation. You'll also find our archives, where you can listen to every episode we've ever done, going back to 2006. Our email address is mail at econtalk.org. We'd love to hear from you. Today is April 11th, 2019, and my guest is urbanist, architect, and author Alain Berteau. He is a senior research scholar at New York University's Moran Institute of Urban Management. He has worked all over the world as a consultant and urban planner. He knows a lot about cities. His book and the topic for today's conversation is Order Without Design, How Markets Shape Cities. Alain, welcome to Econ Talk. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Your book is about how the economics of bottom-up emergent order, what you call markets, interact with the top-down administration and regulation of cities around the world. It's a fabulous introduction to urban economics, and you argue that most urban planners are ignorant of how market forces shape cities. What is that perspective that urban planners have that is missing the economic perspective, and what's the most important aspect of economics that they ignore? Well, uh, urban planner thinks in terms of norms. Uh, that's it in terms of needs. You know, a bit, I would say, like like Karl Marx were uh, discuss about you know to each according to its needs and uh, from each according to uh, his ability. So, uh, for instance, if you ask an urban planner. Uh, what what is the optimum uh, size of uh, housing? Uh, this planner will tell you a number, you know, uh, uh, you know, 50 square meter, 60 square meter, something like that. If you ask uh, the the same question to an economist, the economist will say, well, it all depends, uh, you know. And uh, so, for a, th- this is really the big difference between planners and economists. Uh, planners do not think about scarcity. They consider that uh, you know what is important is uh, what people need. So they de- decide what people need depending on on norms that uh, you know sometimes make sense. For instance, uh, to decide what is the minimum size of a house, they will say, well, uh, most people in the city have two children, so they need two bedrooms, and the bedroom, uh, there will be a bed which has this size, therefore uh, the size of a bedroom will be, say, 12 square meter. Uh, Then you had uh, a kitchen, a bathroom, and a living room, and uh, that will be the norms. And they say anything below that is socially unacceptable. We should not allow anybody to build that. The, the effect, of course, is that in area where people are relatively poor and construction is expensive or land is expensive, they eliminate a large number of people from having legal housing. They don't, of course, exclude people from the city. People don't go away because so they will just go in the informal sector, either uh, you know crowding existing housing or building illegally. So that's really the big difference between planners and uh, uh, you know and economists. It's a uh, it's a great example uh, that you give about the minimum housing. We're going to come back and talk about that in some detail because I had was ashamed to say didn't fully appreciate. Uh, some of those factors that you're mentioning. But I think what you're highlighting there that's crucial is is the difference between norms and prices and then the role that information plays in what people desire. And right. the planner doesn't know what people desire. They, they may think they know what's best sometimes for those people. Right. But often, usually I would say, people know what's best for themselves. Absolutely. Uh, for instance, for housing, you know, they every household make a trade-off between location, price, and size, and uh, this trade-off is done differently by different households. It's a very, very important thing. Uh, the tendency of planners is to concentrate on, for instance, the size of the quality of housing, and forgetting about location. So that's why you see so many. Uh, public housing, for instance, uh, which are in terrible location, which are complete poverty traps because they are inaccessible to most of the jobs. Yeah, and we'll also talk about that too. But I want to start with a, a formative experience that you write about in the book, 
Uh, it was 1965. Uh, you were a young man. Uh, you had a job. It was a great opportunity for you to be on the ground. You were approving permits, building permits in a city of 80,000 people in Algeria. I'm not going to get the town right. It's Tlemcen. Tlemcen, yes. And you learned a lot from that. Describe what that experience was like and what you learned. Well, you know, I was still, uh, I had not graduated yet, so I, I was still a student, but I had this job, you know, a bit like a Peace Corps, let's say. And uh, suddenly I was in a position of responsibility. I had a staff and uh, my job was to apply the law, which was uh, in a in a big book, which was called, called the Urbanism. And uh, I assume first that the people who wrote this book were much smarter and more educated than I was, and that I had to take it seriously. Now, when I compare what the book was uh, of regulation was prescribing to what the people wanted to build in Algeria, and the people, by the way, who applied for building permits, there were many people who didn't apply for building permit and built informally. So those people who apply for building permit uh, wanted to maximize the size of their house. And also uh, the, the houses they wanted to build reflected the local culture, which uh, uh, put a big emphasis on privacy. So the Code de l'Urbanisme was, uh, of course, developed in France. You know, Algeria was a former French colony. And uh, the people who developed the norms had in view, in fact, the suburbs of Paris. You know, what people would like in the suburb of Paris, where, where you know, what type of housing they would like. So it required first... Uh, relatively large windows, uh, low large windows, and a lot of setbacks between uh, between buildings. So you could have a little garden in between, which could be seen from the streets. You know, not very different from an American suburb, although a little smaller probably. Uh, and in Algeria, uh, the the people wanted something very different. They, they they value privacy very much. So uh, they don't like a large window. Uh, on the ground level. So they will tend to put tiny little window on close to the roof. They prefer to have a central courtyard, on, you know, a, ha a house, uh, or, you know, all the rooms oriented around the central courtyard. And uh, that of course is impossible if you have a relatively small lot and if you have to give setbacks between uh, your property line and your line of construction. So the result was that if I applied the regulation, I had to uh, refuse to give the building permit. But as an architect, I had to recognize that the plan which were provided to me on the basis of approval made a lot of sense. Actually, they made much more sense than the, 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 the suburban house in Paris. So the first two or three days, uh, I was so intimidated, I had a, an assistant who was already preparing the answer and usually refusing the permit and uh, quoting, uh, you know, the norms which were violated by the plan which was proposed. So the first two or three days I, I signed because I was so intimidated. But I felt really very bad about it because suddenly I realized that uh, – I was doing a disservice to the city. You know, here are those people that wanted to build legally. They had a plan, they designed a plan, which as an architect, I could see this plan makes sense. There was nothing wrong with this plan. And then I was obliged to tell them you cannot build or, or you have to build something that uh, might be okay in a suburb of Paris, but would be terrible in Tlemcen uh, in terms of uh, culture and also in terms of climate, by the way. You know, the, the central courtyard is is much more, uh, in, in North Africa, uh, the central courtyard is much more uh, pleasant for a house. So after three days, I decided I, I couldn't continue signing those permits. So I went to see the prefet. The prefet is, is the chief of uh, all the civil servants in the city. He's a representative of uh, the central government. And he was a young guy like me. And as inexperienced as I was, 
So uh, I, I told him the problem. I explained to him. And I said, could I, instead of using the book of regulation, could I just use common sense? You know, I'm an architect. I'm, a, you know, able to judge a, a, a building, whether it makes sense or not. And so the prefect told me, yes, go ahead, do that, yes. So during my tenure there, which was another six months, um, I gave building permit just uh, entirely based on what I thought was right and not following the law, actually, uh, at all. Well, we, we get away with it, fortunately. <laughs> what, what, what I love about the story, actually, well, there are many things I like about it, but the part I like is when you were given this book and I have this image – of you know this enormously fat book of of regulations, the uh, whatever it was of urbanisme, the uh, light, the, yeah. So you have this fat book, and you said a minute ago you said it was written by people who were smarter and I forget what else you said maybe more experienced than you. Well, it's, yes, right. Yeah, but yeah. they didn't have the relevant experience or the relevant smarts for that book to apply to that situation on the ground where the circumstances of time and place and other things were very different. And culture, yes, yeah. especially culture. Yes, I mean, this is, again, what uh, Hayek developed very much is the lack of information. You know, when you want to plan for others, you need some information. And usually you think you have this information, but you don't. So you take the wrong decision. Many parts of the book are critical of planning regulations and, and visions and um, reminds me a little bit of Adam Smith's Man of System, the idea that you can move people around like pieces on a chessboard. And, of course, you find out, as Smith says, they have emotion all their own. So much of your book's an illustration of that. But you're not anti-regulation. You certainly suggest in a number, many places that regulation is necessary. What are some of the regulations that are necessary in, in urban settings and why are they important? Well, for instance, uh, you know, Every city in the world, even in uh, you know the Middle Ages, even antiquity, had regulation which we like call uh, a good neighbors regulation. For instance, uh, you find in uh, ancient Greek cities that uh, I found that also in Chinese cities that it was forbidden to dump water from your roof hmm. to your neighbor property, and of course dirty water even more. You know that was a rule that you had to you know, was enforced. Uh, there were a number of rules like that. So basically, uh, there are rules about what uh, economists will call negative externality. You cannot cause, you know, some uh, uh, problems to your neighbor by your own action. So those rules are okay. Then there are some rules, I think, which are much more technical. For instance, uh, uh, building code, the way concrete should be poured, the way... Uh, structure, you know, if you have a steel structure, the way it should be assembled, which is really the state of the art so that the, the structure will be, uh, you know, would be would be solid and will not collapse. So th those are legitimate rules. There are rules about uh, fire regulation, although sometimes they go a bit over the top, but say fire regulation are also important. The way you connect, you know, if you have, you are in a city with a sewer system, the way you connect your your house to the sewer system has to be regulated. You cannot do it the, the way you want. So there are a number of rules like that. The rule I, I you know, I argue against are rules which affect consumption. That means which set the minimum amount of floor space for a house or for an office or for a restaurant and uh, or the minimum amount of land which is required to build to build something on it i think that those rules uh, are arbitrary that uh, people are able to see uh, how large a house is and whether they are ready to live in it or not uh, you know, contrary to, for instance, uh, if you visit a, a, an apartment and select uh, a, an apartment, sorry, an, a, a building, an apartment in this building, you may not be able to know whether the structure is solid or not. So that's why you need a regulation for that. You may not be able to know whether if there is a fire, you will be able to escape. So you need a regulation for that. But whether, you know, the height of a building 
or the size of an apartment and the size of a kitchen or thing like that, this is up to you. You make your own trade-off. You are able to see it. So I don't see why those things are regulated. So let's back up a little bit and talk about your general view of cities, which is um, quite uh, illuminating. You know, I was just in New York uh, a few days ago on uh, on Sunday. I was visiting uh, some friends, but when I usually visit a large city like New York, I'm I'm a tourist. I, as a visitor, see a city as a collection of interesting sites, whether it's the Empire State Building or the Colosseum in Rome. There's entertainment. There's special events. I'm on a, I'm a traveler. But you argue, and quite powerfully, that what a city is fundamentally is a large, dense labor market. How does that affect how you see a city and how the key parts of a city, which I would say you, you talk about in your book quite a bit, the housing stock, the transportation opportunities, and then land prices, how those three things interact given that a city is a large labor market? Yes. I think that the, this aspect of the labor market is is very important because this is the foundation. You know, the, the working of the labor market is a foundation for everything we like in cities, including the, the monument you quote, you know, uh, the Coliseum or the Eiffel Tower or things like that uh, were made possible because there was a very efficient labor market in the city which produced those monuments. So uh, when the labor market is efficient, then you can produce a lot of things which make the city much more pleasant. But the foundation is still this labor market. If people cannot get to their job uh, in a relatively short time, uh, the the city will the city economy will fragment in a way and become less and less efficient. So that's what uh, what is important. This is why I think also it is important for me. It was very important to live in different city, very different from visiting. You know, as you as you mentioned, if you live in a city, for instance, when I I first went to work in Chandigarh in India, you know, the the city uh, designed by Corbusier, uh, I was working there, and suddenly. Uh, I had to go to work. I had to meet with friends. I will. Uh, we will go to restaurant together or to cafe. Uh, I had to get new clothes, uh, and all that uh, activity in the cities, which are very much linked to uh, to the labor market. You know, the the tailors, the, the people who are selling clothes, has to be had to be in a certain part of the city in order to have clients. And for me, I had to add access to them too for the city for me to be to be pleasant. So it's it's not so much as visiting monuments, it's living there. Uh, my definition of the labor market sometimes is a little different from uh, what people think of a labor market. Labor market is not just to have a job and having a job close to your house and stay in this job all your life. Uh, a labor market is the ability for an individual to look at different jobs constantly and eventually change job if you are not satisfied with your current job or if you find it boring or if you think it's not paying enough. And again, here in looking for a job, you make you make a trade-off. You make a trade-off between the, the time commuting, the salary you will have, the people you will be working with, whether they are pleasant or not, and maybe also, and obviously also, uh, the interest of the job, you know, whether it leads to something really interesting in the future or not. So those trade-offs will be made very differently by different people. And that's why the idea of some planner to try to match housing and employment uh, is a is a complete illusion and uh, doesn't work. The labor market, the functioning of the labor market means being able to change jobs uh, as you like it and not being constrained so much by transport um, or affordability. From the employer point of view, it's the same thing. Uh, you move to a large city like New York or, or London and if you move to this city, everything will be more expensive there. But you move to this large city in order to select the right employees. And sometimes you may have to change your staff also to uh, to reflect your 
again the constraint from uh, the the world and so you should be able to select people who are not just living within uh, a kilometer from your enterprise, but uh, among the 20 million people living in New York City. That's a, that's the way the labor market works. So you see, again, uh, sometimes my my. Uh, idea of labor market is misunderstood by some planner. They think that if they could match, um, you know, le- housing and job, that will solve the problem. That will because it will really minimize transport. I always remind people that in most jails now, uh, people have a job. They have no commuting, and uh, but it you cannot expect you know people working in jail uh, to be very productive nor very inventive. Because that's not, a, you know, this is not a labor market. To be employed in itself is not a labor market. That was the same thing in, in Russia or, or in China, you know, before the reform. Uh, enterprise had their own housing, and very often the housing was relatively close to the enterprise. So uh, you could say that it was a perfect accessibility. People, you know, didn't have to commute too much to go to their job. Uh, but... It was not a labor market in the sense that people were uh, employed in the same factory or the same enterprise for all their life, whether they like it or not, whether they were competent to do it or not. So that was not a labor market. And that's why the, you know, the Chinese did their reform. It was precisely for this reason, the, the very, very low productivity of the labor force. And the same thing for Russia. You know, Russia, they very uh, educated labor force. And with a terribly low productivity. And it was, in my opinion, because of this lack of labor market. You have most people were just uh, misemployed. We have two issues there. One is people were not necessarily assigned to the tasks that was the most productive. And their incentive to work hard was not always there because pay was not necessarily correlated with that. Uh, but, the, but to go back to a, a modern American city without those extreme restrictions... I love how you talk about the role that that land prices play play because and in transportation how they interact. So, for example, in the 19th century, you either walked or rode a horse. So, as a commuter uh, to your job, you had to be within walking distance, and you, obviously, you can walk a long way. But most people don't want to walk more than an hour. Uh, that's a long walk. So, yes. the city was constrained by that. Reality that the way you could get from wherever you lived to where you wanted to work had to be less than an hour. With modern transportation, uh, what takes an hour to commute is suddenly a lot farther away. A person can then choose if they want to have a bigger house far from their job where land prices are lower. If they want to live close to their job, their job isn't closer to the center of the city where land prices tend to be higher, they have to take a smaller unit and they make that trade-off and they make that decision. And the stock of houses and, the, and where jobs and houses are located are constantly in, in flux, constantly adjusting to what people want. And that's just, a, I think, a beautiful way to think about how markets work. Right. Yes, absolutely. And again, you know, the choice, you could, you could have uh, two households with exactly the same income for some reason, some will prefer to live in a small apartment close to the center of the city and the other household, exactly the same size, exactly the same income, will prefer a much larger house uh, in the suburb. And this is the way an efficient s- city works. Uh, this allow, and this is of course prices, which are the mechanism of prices, which is a a self, uh, you know, it's a it's a self-generated mechanism, uh, which provide this this choice, and I think this is a very important aspect. Another aspect of price is uh, the recycling of land when a land use is obsolete. Uh, it's possible that in a city. Uh, 40 years ago, you had houses which were built relatively close to the city, but that was a suburb at the time. So the people will consume relatively large amount of land. Uh, But as the city expands, there's more, much more demand for this land, which is relatively close to the center and to the amenity of the center. So the price of land here will increase 
and will push developers to change the housing stock in something uh, with a higher density. This is, com- I think, completely legitimate. It's a uh, it's a mechanism. Uh, which is self-generated, you do not have a planner to decide, haha, this is the time to have apartment here and uh, uh, and individual houses there. Uh, it is just, uh, you know, the way things work automatically. Again, uh, the big lesson from Russia and China, pre-reform China, was that you know, sometime in the center of the city, you had uh, you had area which were devoted to warehouses, or you have old factories which had been there for 60, 70 years. And if you do not have a price mechanism to recycle the land, it is really the urban planner who have to take decision, ha, we have to now remove this uh, factory which is in the center of the city. Uh, we have to move it somewhere else. And there is no no way to pay for it because uh, land, uh, I quote, belongs to the people, therefore has no no value. Therefore, uh, you know, it's a net uh, removing an old factory from the center city and redeveloping the land in a, in a, in a uh, common economy appears to be a cost where in fact in a market economy, it is a benefit to a lot of people. And the market figures out whether that should be a loft or a different kind of factory or an office building or a playground or a, you know a, a zone for kids to to do some fun st- things or a yoga studio all those things are up for grabs and the market That's just right. does that yeah. a, that assignment without a we using the information that people have in their heads but isn't generally available to the planner That's right yeah and you know, they, this is a. Uh, that's where sometimes also I argue against zoning plan. Not necessarily all zoning plan, but against zoning plans because a zoning will uh, already, uh, you know, affect a use to a certain area, and it's possible that this is not the best use. That some, you know, for instance, uh, uh, l- let us see uh, downtown uh, New York. You know, the Wall Street area. For a long time, uh, it was a you know mostly office building. You know they were financial thing, and it was considered you know it was considered not fit for for housing. For some reason, after nine uh, eleven, there were a, a lot of firms left uh, Wall Street area, and suddenly uh, people discovered that there was a lot of demand for people living. In the Wall Street area, you know, it, it can be very attractive if this is what you like. And so the zoning was finally amended so that you could have a residential building in this area, which are now, my belief now is that about half the land use in the, uh, in the Wall Street area are residential condominium. So you see here again, uh, sometimes the zoning, uh, you know, built, you know, designed to protect individuals against externality, against bad neighbors, are in fact preventing them from having the choice they want. You write, quote, a city's productivity depends on its ability to maintain mobility as its built up area grows. And we think about a city, end of quote, think about a city that spreads out as people come moving into the city to find new job opportunities or whatever amenities are there that people are enjoying. And how, how is that mobility maintained? What's the role of, of government in, in making sure that people can get from different places in the city to other places who does and who does it well and who does it poorly? Well, first of course, you have to have the right of ways uh, to have uh, means of transport. So one of the first job of the planner is really as a city expand to separate what is private and what is public. Uh, what is private are the, the the lots, you know, which will be developed by, by developers, whatever they use. And what is public is, of course, the right of way of streets and maybe some amenities like parks, a river, you know, the, the, the shore of a river or a lake or something like that. So that's the first thing. If the planners do not do that, and and in many cities they do not do that because they do not believe that the city will grow, or they want to curb 
spoil, quote, uh, then they do not, dev- you know, they didn't have, they do not develop those right of ways for future transport. Uh, then, you know, you have cities like uh, Jakarta or Bangkok, which were always, the, the planner always thought that they would be kind of garden cities and they will not really expand. It was not desirable for them to expand. So they, they never designed the right of ways of, for the expansion. Then you have, of course, terrible traffic jams because you just do not have enough space. Whether the people use buses, taxi, or individual cars, or bicycle, or rickshaw, you just do not have enough space. So that's one thing which is important, is to establish in advance the right of way for uh, for city to develop one very good example of a positive example was the grid of new york you know which was established uh, in uh, if i remember well 1805 and uh, included an expansion of new york more than uh, 20 times compared to what it was so that was very enlightened now one could argue whether the avenue were wide enough or, or too wide or the street were too long or something, that was not important in my opinion. You know, you could, uh, uh, what was important is to establish the right to build on a very, very large area by separating public from private. Immediately you establish by doing that a land market you have a transparency. You know that when you buy a, a lot somewhere, even if it's far away from the city, you know how far you are from an avenue. You know how uh, wide it will be the street in front of your house. And therefore, you you, you can buy a, a piece of land with a, a complete transparency in, in price. You know the information is. So many planners forget to do that or think that um, – you know, they, they want things like uh, compact city. So a compact city will be more compact if they don't uh, develop uh, roads uh, in the, you know, in the in the periphery. Uh, then as the city grows, of course, the mode of transport uh, will have to grow also and will be different. And uh, so the basic mode, as you say, was was walking and horses. Uh, then you start having uh, streetcars, and the streetcars then require a certain density to develop. You know, you, you can walk to a streetcar, but you can walk all, only that much. So that requires a relatively high density. Then you had individual cars. So now the individual car suddenly multiply the supply of land available, let's say the supply of land which will give access to a job within half an hour. And um, there, uh, suddenly you have a very, very large area, a lot of choices. And I think that's a, that's a beauty of transport. Now, when a city becomes much larger than that, for instance, if you look at the Peel River Delta in China, you know, the, the area around uh, Guangzhou, Hong Kong, Macau, uh, these are area of 60 million people on uh, more than 100, uh, let's say the dimension are about 150, you know, about 100 miles by uh, 60 miles. Uh, here, you cannot have uh, traditional means of transport here. You know, you could expect, you know, the subway of Hong Kong is wonderful. The subway of Guangzhou is wonderful, but it will not allow you to develop a labor market uh, corresponding to this uh, 60 million people, impossible. It's too slow. So you have to devise, uh, you have to devise a new system of transport, which will probably link individual transport with fast rail to go from one area to of the metropolitan area to another for long distance. And this is what the Chinese are working on right now. Unfortunately, that's not what we are working on so far much in the, in the United States or in Europe, except maybe with the advance now of a self-driving car. And I think probably self-driving minibuses will probably change this and allow those labor market to integrate a much lo- larger area. This is really our survival. This, uh, uh, when, For instance, if you take a city like Mexico City, uh, which is 25 million people now, uh, the labor market is not uh, 
corresponding to 25 million people. The labor market within Mexico City is fragmented in probably five or six smaller labor markets and therefore much less efficient because the transport system has collapsed. Uh, you know, the, the, they are, most of the transport now are provided by minibuses, but the minibuses are not that efficient. The city also re- refused to recognize them as a, a legitimate means of transport. Uh, the individual car takes too much, you know, consume too much real estate com- with the density of Mexico City, which is very high. So if you are in a very dense area, uh, real estate is expensive. If you have a car which consume a lot of real estate, you, uh, you know, it's very costly for the city. It's not very efficient. So here we, we are at this threshold. If we understand what the labor market and large labor market bring to a city, then we have to invent new means of transport. We cannot just expand the means of transport we have, which work quite well for city, let's say, below 5 million people, but not so well for city much larger than that. And again, because of the efficiency of very large labor market, we have to face the reality that whichever country develop integrate labor market of 60 million people like or 100 million people like the Chinese now decided to do, if they succeed in providing transport uh, to unify this labor market, they will outgrow us in terms of productivity in a way that we cannot even conceive it. Well, we had um, Jason Barr on the program talking about skyscrapers in New York City and Your discussion of mobility reminds me of we tend to think of a city as a two-dimensional place. There's these roads that go in different places. Sometimes there's buses, bicycles, cars, foot traffic on those roads. But the two hidden aspects of a city that, that give them three dimensions are the subway below the street, which gives you a sort of a duplicate expressed form of travel. Uh, at a high cost, obviously, but worth it in, in, in a dense setting, potentially. And then the elevator, which allows you to increase, to multiply the city up into the, into the, into the, uh, into the heavens. And that's just such a, a beautiful image that, for me, that the way that human creativity has allowed that density of, of not just labor markets, but, of course, social life and uh, food and everything that cities have, music. Uh, it's just an incredible thing that we have that compared to, say, a city of hundreds of years ago, which was a very different place. Yes, absolutely. You know, the, what makes a city is really not the land. It's the floor space. So if you stack up floor space, <laughs> uh, you have a lot of advantages. You could uh, – uh, you. There's, you know, there's a subway that you you talk about, but there's also tunneling, which is a new thing now because probably the cost of tunneling is going to go down with a new technology, and that will be a way to uh, make again city much more viable because you could increase also the different the viability of different mode of transport in very dense area. What what is what is tunneling? Uh, sorry, tunneling is a uh, digging tunnel. You know what? Uh, um, to do what? Uh, well, to do uh, to do highways underground. Oh, okay. Whoa. Uh, oh, like a tunnel, like a highway tunnel. Yeah. Yes, or, yes, sorry. Or My, you could put a parking lot underground or you could put apartments underground for people ab- who… Absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. For instance, one thing in New York City that should have been done and, and should be done is to put all the cars which are parked in the street should be underground in a privately owned parking. So they will pay market price for parking. And uh, the, the area of the road of, of the streets in New York, uh, especially in Manhattan, should be entirely devoted to either pedestrian or uh, taxi or Uber or whatever, or, or cars. And, uh, you know, to have, uh, uh, to have, you know, People will park their car the entire year uh, in the street is a complete waste of space and they park it uh, free, you know. I mean, in the most, uh, probably one of the most expensive real estate price in the world, you have you have people who claim uh, 10 square meter of uh, uh, street space uh, permanently for free. Well, I'm going to move to affordability and I'm going to, which is a 
issue that is extremely important in America these days. We've had many conversations about it. And I'm ashamed to say uh, I learned when I said I think I said earlier, I learned way too much from your book. I I realized something uh, that I should have realized long ago. And I I want to introduce that by going back to New York City, uh, which along with, say, San Francisco, Boston, uh, other American cities has a huge issue because rents are very high. Uh, and you say shockingly in your book to me <laughs> that that not every urban planner understands the connection between the price of land and rent, which is yeah. fascinating. But we'll put that to the side. There are these American cities where, where land is very expensive and rents are very expensive. And it's increasingly difficult for people to get to move there be, to find the jobs that, that often are uh, – uh, productive for them to take. So a friend of mine, I was walking down the street in New York on Sunday, and I hadn't read your book yet. I read it over the last three days. He says to me, why is why are, why are is it so expensive to live here? You know, the easy answer, there's two easy answers. The easy answer is, well, a lot of people want to live here because uh, of the amenities. The collection of people who are already here creates a great productive place to work, to play, to eat, to enjoy, to frolic, etc. It's a great city. So a lot of people want to live here. That's one reason. The second reason, of course, is that there are a lot of restrictions on supply. So there's zoning and it's there's permits and it's expensive to get, do all that and delays. And so as a result, to make it worthwhile to put up a building, it's very expensive. So I, I know all that. I told him that. But I, the real question then is, but what changed? Because – you know, 100 years ago, New York was an attractive place to live, and there was lots of access to all kinds of housing. And now I think people have the following feeling, which is wrong. Uh, I think a lot of people believe that housing is expensive in, say, a city like New York because developers, they're greedy, and they can make more money selling luxury apartments. So, of course, they don't build any housing for the poor. And the only thing that will allow there to be housing for the poor is some either government construction or housing subsidies. But what I learned from your book, and this is the, the embarrassing thing, is that, well, the kind of regulation they have in New York is really important. It's not just that it's hard to build a new building. They have really specific laws about how big an apartment has to be. And that kind of changes everything. So talk about the role that minimum standards play in affecting the mix of housing that's available in a city like New York. And then you talk about the uh, – I think it's the Chambre, Chambre du Bon in, in yes. Paris. And talk about how that opportunity to allow flexibility is so important. And well, you can react uh, to that long speech as well any way you want. Sorry for that. Long. <laughs> no, no, not at all. Uh, well, yes, you see – Households uh, make a choice, make trade-off between the quantity of floor space they want and the location and the time commuting. And that's their choice. As soon as the regulator wants to be nice with those households by saying, no, 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 you would like to live in the center of Manhattan, but in a 30 square meter, but in fact, uh, you would be much better off if we impose developer to build at least 60 square meter, you know, and, and not less. So as soon as they do that, they, of course, eliminate a large number of people who cannot afford those uh, 60 square meter. This is not the only thing which creates constraint in New York or San Francisco. It's not only regulation, you know, those minimum uh, apartment size. Uh, you have all sorts of zoning which do not allow you, you know, for instance, in Manhattan, you will not allow housing in some area which are still considered manufacturing for some reason, although they, there's practically no manufacturing left in Manhattan. But in Soho, for instance, you know, just the area, uh, you know, in Soho, you, you have a, several blocks which are manufacturing, and as there was no no demand for manufacturing in those blocks. You know, you have to be crazy to try manufacturing in this area of New York. Uh, they were a number of artists were located there because uh, there were those empty building and 
they were not squatters, you know, they, they, they paid a rent to the owner, but it was illegal. At the same time, uh, the city realized that th- those artists, you know, it was embarrassing for New York City to kick out artists from uh, loft, you know, former industrial loft, which were empty. So they decided not to change the zoning. Instead of saying, well, this area is excellent for housing, why don't we allow housing to be built there? They say those artists who can demonstrate that they work there, we will, they will have to send a portfolio of their work to the city. It's still there, by the way, if you want to apply yourself as an artist in New York. Uh, you know, I, I think my book gives the website where you can apply as an artist. And uh, so they will send their, their portfolio. The city will decide if they are bona fide artists. And therefore... In the regulation itself, it says a certified art- artist will be assimilated to a small manufacturer and therefore will be allowed to live and work in this area. You know, this is a complete uh, absurdity, of course, which limit, uh, limit completely. Uh, by the way, uh, that means also that those artists consume much more floor space. Uh, than than they should, you know. If they wanted to consume that much floor space, they should go to Queens or they should go to Long Island or maybe New Jersey, uh, you know, and, and commute. There is no reason for uh, for having that. So, and that at the expense, let's say, of the school teacher, for instance, uh, who is teaching in a school in Manhattan and cannot find possibly any house to live in, except. Some somewhere in Long Island or in New Jersey with a, an hour and a half commute one way. So you see, this is, I, I will say even that uh, this is criminal, although I, I don't believe it's a conspiracy. I believe it's incompetence. You know, uh, Albert Hirschman used to say, uh, not talking too much about zoning, but uh, uh, certainly not about zoning, but about uh, uh, many regulation or management rule that uh, we have a case where the weak are oppressed by the incompetent. And I think that this is exactly what is happening now in New York and, uh, uh, you know, and, and San Francisco and, and cities like that, or in Paris and London, uh, the people who have relatively low income but have a regular job. You know, the uh, housing for People who have a regular job in the city should not be a problem. You know, housing for people who are uh, in the streets, you know, homeless, that's a different. This is a social problem and that's the, the city has to take care of them, uh, you know, with subsidy. I, you know, this is a different thing. But for me, the test is if a school teacher who has a job who is absolutely indispensable for the working of the city cannot afford to live within half an hour uh, uh, commuting time from his or her school, there is something wrong with our system. And this something wrong is entirely due to regulation. There is absolutely no reason for it. You, you see a lot of numbers which are buried in the zoning code. For instance, uh, in New York, you, every every uh, you know every zone. For instance, one zone will be called R6, uh, residential six. And then there's a long line of parameters that uh, decide what should be the, the, you know, the dimension of uh, uh, things which are built in the residential six. And among them is a, is a number, which is a number of square feet. Uh, this number of square foot is in fact, uh, you have to divide the total area of the building that you are allowed to build in this zone, divide it by this magic number, and that will give you the maximum number of dwelling units that could be built in this area. I challenge anybody to tell me what is the advantage of the city to establish this, uh, this minimum number of dwelling, this, sorry, maximum d- number of dwelling. Uh, the density of New York 80 years ago was practically double of what it is now. So it's not the number, it's not that our infrastructure cannot cater to more people. It's only a completely arbitrary number. Uh, and it's, it limits, of course, the number of uh, dwelling who can be done. The household size in New York now has decreased, you know, some 
40 years ago, it was again around 4.5. Now, if I remember that's, well, that's people it, per household. Uh, people per household, yes. It's it's uh, you know people per family. Let's say uh, it's uh, now it's about 1.2 or something like that. But uh, this magic number I was talking about in the zoning code, assume it is relatively large because it's assumed that you still have a, a relatively large family. So it obliged developer to build relatively large apartment because if not, they will be uh, they will run against this rule about uh, the number of dwelling units per per uh, per acres, which would be too high. Uh, you know, in the in the New York Times, some about a year ago, there was a very interesting article which was extremely well documented, which showed that in Manhattan, 40% of the building could not be built today, not not because of a you know building code or fire safety, or regulation yeah. safety, no, because because there are too many apartments in those buildings already, too many dwellings. Because those buildings are too high or because there are too many businesses in the area. Would you imagine some planners who have the knowledge to know what is the optimum number of business in Manhattan? You know, where does it get that? Where it comes from? And the problem is a bit like the problem we are talking uh, at the very beginning of this talk about, uh, uh, about Algeria, you know, all these numbers are in the building code, in the in the building regulation, and people assume that the numbers who are there have a reason. You know that somebody really smart that put this number there, and, an expert, and an expert, and and nobody knows why they are there, but they say somebody must know, and therefore do not challenge them. They feel that here goes the neighborhood. You know, if you change this number, maybe the, the something will collapse or something like that. It's not true. Uh, you know, so I recommend really a regulatory audit. You know, to get rid of of all those regulations for whom we don't know what the reason is, or the reason uh, was maybe valid uh, hundred years ago, but not anymore. So just to highlight this, um, and there are other regulations you haven't mentioned about. Restrictions of how many units can be on any one block, the number of unrelated individuals that can live in any one apartment. And of course, many of these are violated, as you point out, in what you call the informal sector. People find ways to get around some of these. It's not right, perfect. Yeah. Yes. But the point that's – I just want to emphasize this because it's – again, it's so obviously true. And it, the fact that I struggled to notice it is uh, disturbing but illuminating, which is – it's true that it's all, that that a high end apartment can rent for a lot of money, but a lot of smaller units can rent for a lot of money too. Even though they'd be less per unit, you can just change the floor space. And the I'll put a video up. Um, it just blew me away of of an apartment in Paris that's and I, I'm not exaggerating. This is the exact number. It's eight square meters. It's that's about right. eighty six square feet. Which is a very small. It's a slightly. It's about the size of a of a child's bedroom in a in a small suburban house, and in that space, there's a kitchen, a bathroom, a bed, a table, book storage space, uh, other storage space. It's a it's a beautiful work of art, and I'll put a link up to it. But that that apartment is would be illegal in New York, obviously, and the point about child about household sizes is, is just crucial. As fewer and fewer Americans are married and more and more people are living on their own, the idea of, of limiting household size of square footage is just a recipe for high rents and people living very far from where they work or only rich people living in those in those in those in those urban centers. And it's just a, it's an easily fixed problem. Now, I want to say one thing bad about that and one thing uh, in defense of it and let you react. So you suggest it's incompetence. There's also, of course, uh, the uh, road to hell being paved with good intentions. Some of these were laws were passed yeah. to, to benefit people, to make sure they had enough room and space to live. And, of course, some of it's designed to protect the people who already live there who benefit from the rents. It's a classic what we call bootlegger and Baptist problem where the yes, regulator yeah. invokes a high-intention, wonderful moral reason for the law – but it also benefits, makes other people richer, and those are the bootleggers, and they keep that quiet. Um, 
At the same time, now let me defend. So that's I'm a little more cynical than you, but that's okay. It, let me um, let me defend regulation for a second. On that same walk on the street with my buddy, when I said how uh, horrible it was that all these restrictions were, were the way they were, we happened to be walking in the Chelsea neighborhood. The Chelsea neighborhood is is beautiful. A lot of gorgeous old buildings. They're very low. They're not high uh, multi-story buildings. They're low numbers of stories, you know, three to five stories. Gives it a certain look and feel. And he said, you know, don't you think it's reasonable that the people who live here want to enjoy this kind of feel and look on the streets? And you could say that about many zoning and other types of restrictions, that it creates this this public good, this, this sort of ambiance that would otherwise uh, be destroyed by the self-interest of developers trying to cater to poor people who would like to live in high-rises in those areas, for example. How do you respond to that? Well, uh, yeah, on on your last uh, comment here, uh, yes, but you see, uh, don't forget that Manhattan for many years were, you know, they were mostly brownstone in Manhattan which are very, very nice. Beautiful. And, uh, you know, you could have said we should not have developed Midtown mm -hmm. because there were beautiful brownstone yeah. there and yeah. the people were living there. A city has to evolve constantly. Now, uh, and any city which throws itself in the past is doomed. At the same time, I completely recognize, especially as an architect and a French architect on top of it, <laughs> uh, that uh, uh, I completely recognize the value of keeping some historical neighborhood intact. But let us face it, we can keep those neighborhood intact. For instance, uh, having several streets with brownstone intact, and we should. Do not forget that this will be extreme gentrification. You cannot maintain a brownstone unless you have a lot of money. And uh, it's the same thing for any, any historical building that you want to maintain. Uh, it will have to go to rich people in order to be maintained. If not, they will deteriorate very, very quickly. You know, this is, by the way, what happened in Harlem uh, in the 60s, you know, when I start the uh, end of the 60s, I was working there for the City Planning Commission. Harlem was full of beautiful brownstone. The people living there at the time were extremely poor. Uh, there was a huge crime problem and drug problem. A lot of those buildings, those brownstone, has to be demolished because they were so badly maintained, they were collapsing. Uh, the only way to maintain a brownstone is to have rich people working, uh, you know, living in them. Now, for I get back to your example of uh, Chelsea. Uh, yes, uh, we have to, it's, it's nice to live in Chelsea, but only, uh, you know, if you are protected, uh, you know, from, from the market by living in Chelsea, by a zoning regulation, which prevents people from uh, going and, and living there too. I think that's a, uh, that's a little egoistic, you know, it's not yeah. so, uh, uh, you know, it, it, again, think of my, my school teacher, you know, my school teacher, you know, as a, is teaching at a school, uh, you know, 10 block from there, but have no hope absolutely to live in Chelsea right now. So uh, if you increase the supply and the, the, the supply of smaller uh, dwellings for which there is a demand and which can be very, very attractive if they are, uh, you know. I know by, by the way, when we came to New York uh, with my wife as young immigrants, you know, in 1968, uh, there were still quite a large number of old law tenements which are illegal now. I mean, it's uh, your grandfather, you can still live in them if they are still standing, but it's illegal to build uh, apartments which have the same size as the one we had, uh, you know, in this uh, old law tenement, uh, you know, in Yorktown. And uh, this was wonderful. We were, we had a young kid, you know, we had a toddler, my wife and I, so we were three people in 27 square meter, a little larger than a chambre de bonne, but uh, a little larger. But 
And this is illegal now. For us, it was, it's a, one of the most wonderful souvenirs we had coming and living in New York. You know, we could, we could walk to Central Park on the weekend with our kids. Uh, it was a wonderful thing. Uh, my employer, when, I, uh, when I, we came to New York, I told him I have a wife and a young kid. Uh, how do I get uh, housing in, in New York? And he told me, who? Uh, with the salary you have, he was paying me, so he knew. Uh, you, you will have, you know, you may find something maybe in the Bronx or maybe in New Jersey. And we decided we, we don't want to live in New Jersey. We came from Paris to New York. We have to live in Manhattan. And we made the trade-off of living in a very small area. You know, we furnish it well so that it was very livable instead in spite of being small. But for us, accessibility to the amenities of Manhattan largely compensated the, the size, and it was affordable. You know, we, we were not on the living uh, on a waiting list. You know, when I, I hear the city, uh, the city of New York now saying, "Well, we are going to build affordable housing below market." If it's below market, if the price is below market, it is not serious. It means you have to be on the waiting list for ten years, or you have to go through a lottery. Uh, you know, if you have a, a new job in Manhattan, the way I had coming from Paris, I could not wait uh, to be on the lottery <laughs> or on a waiting list. So uh, we need, if if the program of the city to do affordable housing is below market housing, this is this is a this is a joke. Uh, you have to produce housing which is affordable at market price. Uh, and then you will have enough of it, and you can do it. We can do it. The, the you know the technology allows. One way of doing that, of course, is also to improve transport systems. So you allow people who want to consume a little more to have efficient transport, which bring them to their job. You know, from their house to their job at a longer distance. So you you could have that also. You know, if the transport were more efficient, it would be a way of, of providing. Uh, that's why in my book I link very much. I think the two main job of the urban planner is affordability and mobility. These are the two things. Forget about uh, sustainability, livability, uh, you know, resiliency, and things like that. These are all very nice things, but the main job of the planner is to to ensure that and you can measure mobility you can measure affordability and the planner should say or the mayor let's say uh, uh, should say well this is our target for affordability and mobility we are going to do that and let's see if it works well i want to i want to go back to your story of when you first arrived in new york because you talk about it in the book and i think it really brings home uh what has changed in america and i think it's a tragedy um you mentioned uh, just i didn't I didn't hear it correctly the first time, an old law tenement, meaning I, I assume that's a tenement that had been grandfathered in, um, as you say, that, now, the, the, now would right. be illegal. So here's what you're right. You say you're in a museum and, and the docent was telling you that in the 1850s, quote, immigrants who were fresh off the boat would typically stay only a few months in a tenement. They would then keep moving as their employment and financial circumstances changed. A typical length of stay in the same tenement would be about six to eight months. My wife and I then looked at each other, this is all quote, remembering that this was exactly what we did when in January 1968, we were also fresh off the boat in New York. We changed apartments three times in 30 months. We moved from a flop house on the Upper East Side that was soon going to be demolished to a studio apartment in an old law tenement on the Upper East Side, and then to an entire floor in a townhouse in Brooklyn Heights. I also changed jobs three times. Each time I changed for a more interesting job and a higher salary. This is the type of mobility that we will discuss in this chapter, the ability to move from job to job and from dwelling to dwelling made possible by a transport infrastructure that gives access to millions of potential jobs in less than one hour of commuting time. This mobility was made possible by a buoyant housing and job market, ensuring a low transaction cost of changing jobs and location. By contrast, in Paris, where we came from, housing mobility was hampered by two-year leases that could not be broken without penalties. Additionally, job mobility was frowned on as a sign of instability. Changing jobs three times in 30 months would have resulted in a resume that raised a lot of eyebrows. And then you talk about the fact that you were a little uneasy quitting your job, but how in America that was 
okay, and your boss threw you a party. Congrats, you have a better job. <laughs> but I think the point that's important, and we talk about this a lot on the program, is that you know if you're in West Virginia and your factory closes and you don't have anything to do in West Virginia or Kentucky or Ohio, areas that used to be vibrant that no longer are vibrant economically, and the normal thing Americans did for hundreds of years is they moved. They got up and they moved to a city, but now the ability to move to a city is much harder than it used to be. And I think that's a, a you know, physical mobility is, is down in America. And part of the reason, it's not the whole reason, but part of the reason is the kind of restrictions you're talking about that make it harder for people to find the opportunity near a place that, where they want to live and thrive. And it's um, it's an enormous mistake. And I think it's done, you, know, I, you said it politely, you said it's a form of, of egoism. It's a form of, of selfishness, and it's a failure to recognize that the next generation needs to have a place to use their talents and to experience life fully. And when we zone New York or San Francisco or other places and make it hard for people to move there, I understand why the people who live there already and the people who own the buildings want to profit from it, but it's wrong. It's just wrong. Yes, I absolutely agree with you on that. I mean, for us, uh, you know, again, moving to America was a very important thing. When I, I arrived in New York, uh, my wife uh, didn't work. You know, her English was a little shaky. She could not find work yet before improving her English. So I was only a breadwinner. On top of it, I had a job with Philip Johnson and, you know, the architect. And uh, the it was so good on your resume that uh, he could afford to pay you very little. My guess is that I was... <laughs> Uh, I was paid at the minimum wage and, uh, you know, at the minimum wage, uh, a, a household of three person could survive in Manhattan very well. You know, we, we really enjoyed our time. We were not in poverty at all. We were enjoying it very much. You had a rich but life. We had, <laughs> exactly. Yes. So that's exactly what uh, I wish. Again, you know, I'm talking about this school teacher or people like that will have this opportunity or the person in West Virginia uh, would indeed uh, will be much better off, uh, uh, you know, moving to a large city, which uh, which is affluent, which look for new people where there are so many opportunities and they cannot do that because our frozen, I will call it frozen land use regulation, which are completely obsolete and need to be revised in different way. Now we, we had a guest on Econ Talk, uh, Glenn Weil, and I don't know if you've read his work, but he argues that this frozenness needs to be liberated in creative ways, that there's too much monopoly power in, in land markets. And your book really is a, a statement that market forces actually, when you let them work, are incredibly effective at tailoring opportunities for what people demand. Uh, Glenn Weil and others don't agree. They, they don't – they think we need to change the way property rights are established uh, – why are you so positive and enthusiastic about the role of, of markets in housing where – just to pick on a straw man that, that drives me crazy. Well, it's nothing – you know, in economics, to have competition, you need homogeneous uh, product where, with perfect information. In fact, housing is not, almost incredibly not homogeneous. It's heterogeneous. Every house is unique. Every building is slightly different. The location is certainly different. And people have imperfect information about how the, it's going to, what it's going to be like to live in the house and where, where they can get to from the house. And yet you believe, or at least you argue in this book, that, that, these, that the interaction between suppliers and demanders works well when government sticks to what it does well and doesn't try to overplan. Why, what's, your, what's your reason for that? Look, uh, we see that uh, – we see that, for instance, uh, this market working well in the food industry. You know, if you are in Manhattan, uh, you can have in a, in the same block an extremely expensive French restaurant, and next to it you will have a food court. Yep. And the the food in both will be quite okay, actually. Uh, <laughs> I assume better in the French restaurant, but uh, in a certain way, it will certainly uh, be satisfactory, and you could go from one to another. Why? It's the same in clothes, by the way. You you could have – in Manhattan, you can find fantastically expensive clothes, but you can also, uh, you know, find enough clothes to, you know, be decently uh, close, you know, for, for $400 probably, uh, the entire thing. So uh, why, why is housing different? 
uh, I think that a lot of it has to do with, uh, you know, again, regulation and infrastructure, you know, those two things. Infrastructure has not followed uh, the expansion of cities because uh, always this idea that maybe uh, cities should not grow so much. That there was, you know, especially in, in, uh, you know, when I was a student or when I uh, was a young professional, there was this idea about the optimum size of cities. And so there was a reluctance to have city grow. In a way now, it's uh, it's expressed a bit differently as sprawl. You know, the, the sprawl is kind of the bugaboo of uh, uh, every city. We, we don't want to create sprawl. We want compact cities. Houston, so, Houston's a horrible place because it's oh, that, that's right, yeah. <laughs> so big. Well, Atlanta, or Atlanta, you know, yeah. where it is not. It's just a, it's different trade-off. You know, it's it represents a completely different trade-off. But, uh, and it's very efficient in terms of job. There is no doubt about it, and access to job. So, uh, and price of housing, which is very reasonable in Houston. What what is important here is that the, if you have crazy regulations like we have, the market adapts to those create to those crazy regulation, and that creates a new equilibrium. If you remove those regulation, the entire industry has to readapt to it. Uh, and that's not easy, it takes a long time. Uh, right now in New York, the system, and especially in Manhattan, the system is such that unless you, have a, you are a very large developers and you build for the 10% richer people of Manhattan, which are pretty rich, uh, you cannot build anything really. But in order to do that, you need lawyers which are fantastically expensive who can tell you how much it will cost to change the zoning you know, from this to that. So you buy the land at a certain price, it will take you 10 years and with a constant work, on the on the zoning with your very very uh, specialized lawyer to change the zoning and then you will make a bundle but you can do that only if you build luxury housing so now you are being told uh, by the city uh, we want inclusionary zoning that means every time you build uh, 10 apartments you know eight will be at market two of them will be affordable and we will decide what is affordable. This is, of course, absurd, uh, you know, to have to have the supply of low-cost housing depending on the supply of luxury housing and only a fraction of the supply of luxury housing goes to affordable housing. I mean, I explained that in part of my book here uh, on, uh, on a specific case. Uh, this is absurd. We have to have a market solution. I do not believe that... Uh, you know that there are interests certainly uh, for the status quo. You know there are uh, you know which will want to keep the status quo. I don't think that uh, if we are aware of that, if we are aware of market work, that it's not possible to uh, to build housing which is affordable to a school teacher in New York or San Francisco. Well, I, this is a time when I would normally say my favorite Hyatt quote, but. I'm going to use my second favorite I quote, or maybe my third, which is you use at the beginning of chapter one. You say, order generated without design can far outstrip plans men's con men consciously contrive. Order generated without design can far outstrip plans men consciously contrive. That's from uh, The Fatal Conceit. And, you know, that's just hard for people to to face that. They don't like to – that's, that's – um, it's unpleasant to be made aware of that. Uh, and let's close with this. You, you know, I, I think your perspective is a little unusual, I'm just guessing, in the urban planning community. I say that based on my own knowledge <laughs> yes. and what you say in the book. And I would I would argue that your book kind of takes the fun out of being an urban planner. So I'm, I'm curious how your book's been received by colleagues. And do you think that your perspective on regulation and what you've been talking about today – has a chance to become more widespread and mainstream in, in cities in the world? Well, first, uh, uh, yes, it's unusual, but around the world, uh, I have a number of colleagues who are urban planners and will think the same way I do. 
uh, there are not many, but there are quite a number. And, you know, in countries like India, New Zealand, Australia, uh, Latin America, uh, it's true that there is a general hostility to those ideas. Well, I'm critical of it, you know, of, of the, the profession. Uh, for instance, when uh, my book was uh, published at uh, MIT Press, uh, they were, f- you know, the first review for the first three chapters were done mostly by e- economists, uh, urban economists, and uh, they had some criticism, but they were very positive. So the book, you know, get the okay. Uh, when the book was finished and all the chapters were finished, a mighty price asked two reviewers to review the complete book. Uh, one was an urban economist who said very nice thing. I'm too modest to repeat them. Uh, and the other was from an urban planner. You know, it was anonymous. I didn't. I don't know who they were. My guess is that the urban planner was an academic from the style, uh, and the, the urban planners say a book, like, a book like that should not be published uh, because it's entirely based on uh, uh, idiosyncratic view from a guy uh, based on his own experience. It doesn't address, uh, you know, the he said the academic, he or she says, the academic uh, debate uh, on the nature of urban planning. So you see, yes, it is uh, it is a, a, a big fight. But what's interesting too, I, I'm uh, uh, following on uh, on Amazon. I'm following, you know, the the sale of my book, and uh, in the in the category of urban economics, it's usually within the ten or fifteenth bestseller. Uh, in the category of urban planning. It's about 50 or 60 or something go to 80. So that means that, in fact, uh, most <laughs> urban planners are not reading my book. And that's why so far I have not received any flack yet. You know, I have not Same. received. Uh, so maybe maybe that's a, that's a question. If they are not reading it, then that. Uh, but I think that eventually those ideas are going to, you know, ideas percolate. We should not, you know, they, they go into the ground and then they come back. Back after some time, and uh, uh, so I, I'm I'm rather optimistic. I think also that uh, the the new technology, the new information technology, will make these things much more e- much easier than they were before. Uh, you know, ideas uh, circulate. The good or the bad ideas circulate faster. I think also that uh, transport technology. We are at the eve of a a big revolution in in urban transport. Uh, I'm not completely sure what the outcome will be, but uh, it's there. And it will be the equivalent of uh, going from the horse and walking to uh, to motorized transport. I think, uh, you know, the, the, the self-driving cars and uh, the share, the possibility of sharing small vehicles rather than very large uh, buses, I think this will change too. So all these things put together, I'm rather optimistic. My guest today has been Alain Berteau. His book is Order Without Design, How Markets Shape Cities. Alain, thank you for being part of EconTalk. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you so much. This is EconTalk, part of the Library of Economics and Liberty. For more EconTalk, go to econtalk.org, where you can also comment on today's podcast and find links and readings related to today's conversation. The sound engineer for Econ Talk is Rich Goyette. I'm your host, Russ Roberts. Thanks for listening. Talk to you on Monday.